Okay. okay, everybody, let's get started. I'm really excited to introduce our seminar speaker this week, Professor Ryan McLaren from Notre Dame's Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering. So Professor McLaren is an expert in computational methods for neutron transport and many other areas of computational science, like machine learning, data science, uncertainty computation, and more. He's written three textbooks on these topics and is a fellow of the American Nuclear Society. But one fact that I learned today, which I think is very intriguing, is that he also competed on Jeopardy against Ken Jennings. So I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any questions we have today about his seminar or his research more broadly. But today he's going to speak about time-dependent neutron transport, uh, topics from experimentation that I'm really interested in hearing about. So please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you very much. I had a great event today uh, so far. So the last time I was here, I think it was about 12 years ago, and I had to have an emergency group now. Very nice. So, so far, today has been uh, exponentially better than that. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about time dependent neutron transport problems, and I'm going to hopefully along the way convince you that these are very different than the typical types of reactors from the you may be familiar with. And motivate the, the different types of analysis and that you need and show that computational needs are some pretty useful problems. And here I'm showing a picture of an apparatus for an experiment that was done in 1945. We'll get more issues later, uh, but I, this is we're, we're going to be looking at that uh, with, with modern tools. Thank you. Oh, yes. Click on the speed. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, now I got it. Okay. So uh, as uh, any uh, academic research, most of this work was, was done by my graduate students and uh, former postdocs. So I want to acknowledge my, my research group up there in the upper left. That's spent most of them at uh, an event this past summer. Also, I want to thank the support of my family in the middle there. That's us and me. Uh, we were at study abroad over in Rome. And two of my students, not pictured at the, the baseball game up here, are uh, Sam Fassman and my former postdoc, Elon Varianz, uh, is now at Oregon State. Uh, and they're, they're a picture of me up there with the Alpha Spec, uh, on Jeopardy. I was much younger than that, so you might be able to tell. And then the, the, there's a picture of three books that, I, that I've written uh, one on computational nuclear engineering with Python, and then one on machine learning, and one on certain computation. Also, uh, about a decade ago, I was involved in a startup that was uh, uh, applying data science to uh, business problems, and I was actually uh, quoted in the Wall Street Journal by my NFL draft. So I knew anything about And somebody pointed this out to me just recently that in this picture, there's somebody from Notre Dame not being able to tackle this right now. So uh, they're like, you should get a better picture than that. Uh, but I didn't choose it. Okay, so here is kind of a uh, roadmap of our, of our journey today in, in neutron transport. So we're going to start down here at the bottom and look to motivate you with the, the sense that criticality is not enough to describe some types of nuclear systems. We'll talk about a different type of value a different type of way of thinking about these systems and their solution. And then we'll say, if if we, if we don't want to be smart, we just want to let the computer do everything, what can we do if we have really expensive high fidelity simulations? And that's where we're going to end up. Okay, so a lot of this work has been done in collaboration with uh, this, uh, the, the cement, the center, Exitia Mine Power Neutron Transport. So it's a uh, part of the Energy and Science Science Alliance Program Center. Basically, uh, the, the lead organization here at Oregon State. Uh, along with Notre Dame, uh, NC State, and now Seattle University. What we're trying to do is uh, train a lot of students, but also we are looking at how can we make uh, Monte Carlo methods for particle transport performing on new types of computing architecture, so at the tail type systems. And one of the things that we're doing that uh, I think is interesting broadly is, is taking all of these tools that have been developed over the past uh, past several years of making uh, Python code, Python code is easy to write to make it uh, have good performance on these systems. They're on the library, they're trying to say, make it fast. 
And we're, we're actually trying to do that with the mind of the transport code to see how well it, it performs. And the name of that code is MCDC, and we'll, uh, we'll see that uh, later on in the talk. And there, there's a picture of uh, most of the connecting there. Okay, so let's go back in time to 1945, and that picture was taken that we started off with. And we want to study things, but we don't have much to do. Uh, and so here's, uh, so let's say you're a young out of fish and you're, you have some questions about fission processes that today you might know and take, take for granted. So you, you might wonder, well, how fast does, does a fission reaction occur? It's not something that was known at the time. Does neutron and neutron scattering matter? Do the neutrons scatter off each other with enough, with enough probability of that happening that it affects, uh, affects the reaction? Now I'm going to answer that is typically no. But that was not known at the time. Uh, and be sure that the video of these slides have an important effect. On the reaction, I think there's one more question we have it is what is the energy distribution of the neutron that comes with this? Also, something that wasn't known at the time. And so, but there, there were a surprising amount, uh, uh, a surprising number of things were known. So, reactive cross sections were pretty well estimated from, uh, from theory. And also, the average time between fission reactions in the fast reactor was known because there had been some, uh, some development of some fast reactors. Okay, so our first idea is like, what if we get really close to a runaway chain reaction? So we can study some of these fundamental processes of fission in an isolated way. So he proposed an idea for an experiment to do this. And Enrico Fermi said, I'm not exactly looking here, but that's a nice idea. We want to try it. And but then Richard Feynman had probably the uh, the best description for this idea. It's like it's like taking the tail of a sleeping dragon. So there's an experiment that was was it was called uh, colloquially the dragon experiment. And so let's look what's happening there. So uh, our first was on this experiment. And so here it is. We have suspended in the air a cylinder that composed of uh, fuel. Uh, the rich uranium so surrounded by a tamper in beryllium oxide, in this case, in this, uh, in this falling block. And then on the table, the table that was in that picture we saw, this wasn't in that picture, but here is a, an annulet of fuel surrounded by this beryllium oxide tamper. Uh, and so what we do is, apart from these two things are so critical, you will not have, you will not have a uh, Exponential going in front of others. So we drop it through, it is super uh, they didn't have they didn't want to use a very strong neutron source. So what they do is drop it multiple times, allow the lay neutron per precursor to build up so that every time you drop you get a bigger pulse of neutrons. <laughs> okay, that's this this video showing here. So we take two subcritical masses and just use gravity to combine them and look at what happens. And so you can do things like look at how many neutrons we have. That would tell you something about how fast the fission reactions are happening. You can also irradiate things with neutrons and see how they respond to them. These are things that we can do with And so here's that after the photo that we started off with, and now zoomed out, you can see that whole tower. And the, the, uh, the, the actual fuel block is not shown, is not shown there in this picture, uh, but you can see there's a, there's a, a tube that they uh, the block will fall through, and then there's a catcher at the bottom. Okay, so here's uh, a, a schematic uh, of, of the experiment. So we're going to drop that block uh, through the fuel, and they're super critical when they're getting. Okay, and uh, as I said, drop it multiple times, build up the delayed neutron precursor to get a bigger pulse each time. So what that is in the back is you're starting with. Uh, a large number of neutrons that to then be multiplied exponentially while it's uh, super critical. And so the, this, this figure here is actually showing the data they used to estimate what the level of criticality was with the multiplication factor for this particular experiment was. And we'll talk about what that actually means here in a little bit. And then this, uh, this figure right here is actually the facsimile of the oscilloscope reading of the experiment. And you can see that this, this picture, I got this out of the uh, recent little sound before is that they actually did scan this from, from an old book. You can see the typing on the back of that uh, that day. And so this uh, thermal reading basically it'll go down as it's uh, recording more neutrons. 
uh, in the system. So that this is what they use to estimate uh, the actual amount of neutrons they get. Sorry, they agree. Okay, so this experiment, if we want to think about it from a reactive physics point of view, it, it, it's very unclear. Okay, so here uh, the uh, so reactivity is a measure of criticality. So basically, your reactivity is zero. If you're not familiar with the system is critical, or the chain reaction can proceed itself, can uh, uh, itself. And this, the purple curve here, is the uh, is is that is that criticality. And so, as the block is entering the the, the the fuel on the table, we see that the criticality goes up, and eventually, at this point here, where it's first critical, where the chain reaction is first sustain itself. And then it goes to repeat as the block is moving through uh, the material. And then, and then as it's activated, you see that the, uh, the, the criticality level of the system is going down. Okay, so we have this dynamic criticality uh, excursion. And then we see here that this blue line is that it's the power on a log scale. It actually goes up by nine orders of magnitude in one of these, one of these experiments. And there's also interesting if you look at where the peak criticality is, where the peak power is, there is this lag between the peak reactivity and the peak power. So there is the, the time scale of the reaction happening, that only matters here. And it's a, it's a very interesting problem to look at. Okay, so what do we mean by criticality? And this is just going back to the very basics because I know that there's a lot of people here that aren't just reactor engineers. So this, uh, if we're thinking about a, uh, a, uh, a nuclear system, there's this, this concept of the multiplication factor, sometimes written as K effective. And it tells us how many neutrons we get between each generation. So uh, at the top, we have one neutron initiating fission with an uranium nucleus. And then that produces two neutrons here. And then from these two neutrons, those both hit these. Uh, these are by and we get four here. So this amount there, we would say in this system, this K factor, this multiplication factor is two. It's going up by two energy. Okay. So this uh if this if this uh number K for our system is equal to one, that means I'm put one neutron in and every time through I get another neutron, one neutron out. So the system is not growing in size. I have a constant population of neutrons in my system. In K is equal to one. When K is less than one, I that's called subcritical because the population is going to be going down every generation. And if it's greater than one, it's super critical and we're growing. Uh, we're going uh, geometrically every generation. So this K effective is going to be a function of many things. Uh, it's a function of the number density of the nuclei that you have in your system. It's a function of the energy spectrum of those, those neutrons coming out of the vision process, as well as the materials you have and many, many other things about your This is why we have uh, reactive physics and reactive engineering as research here, because all those things contribute to how this chain reaction works. Okay. But it doesn't necessarily tell us what's going to happen in a in a system that has time dependence as an important feature. So here I'm showing a, uh, a system that is uh, it's a, a contrived system, but it's, it's subcritical. So K for the system is less than one. That means that the, the chain, a neutron chain reaction is will eventually die out. And so in this, in this mock experiment here, we're gonna, we have, we have some uh, design material, here's the component here, and this blue stuff is plastic. So I guess it's probably So we're gonna pulse this in from both sides with a 14 MeV neutron pulse. And if you look at the number of neutrons in the system as a function of time, it looks like this. So uh, this is time in microseconds on the log scale and the relative number of neutrons in the system. So at time zero, when we initially when we initiate this pulse, we're gonna have a fun number of neutrons in the system. And what we see here is that it grows. Okay. And so this is called subcritical multiplication. So even though the system cannot sustain a chain reaction forever, the density of the neutron population dies, we still do have some fission occurring. And so the neutron population grows and before it eventually dies out. Okay. And that's the idea of subcritical multiplication. And so what that means here is what 
what this is showing is just because we can't, we don't have a critical system or a system where we have a number of neutrons that's going to eventually go to infinity or super critical, it doesn't mean we can't have neutrons uh, multiply. And so if you want to say something about the system, just saying that K is less than one doesn't tell us what's going to happen in yeah. this kind of experiment. <laughs> Okay, so if we think about what that multiplication factor is actually doing, when we look, when we look at the mathematics, and we go to the mathematics, think about what it's doing. So, in any, in any system, we're going to have a steady solution. We need to have a balance between the, between the production mechanism of the things that we're, that we're, we're conserving and the law. Well, here we're looking at the conservation of neutron in our system. If we're going to have a steady solution that's not equal to zero, we're going to have to exactly balance the leakage of neutrons, the neutrons leaving my system, and the neutrons are being absorbed inside of there. And because these are a way to lose neutrons in the system. And that's got to be balanced by the production of neutrons from fission. Okay. And so when these things are perfectly aligned, that's when we have this K factor of one or multiplication factor of one. Okay. Plus, if the leaf of entropy gets too large, then that side of the balance is going to want to fall down. So we have to, we have to put our finger on the scale there and force there to be more vision. And so that's what we do when K, uh, when, uh, I should say K effect is less than one, we need to, we need to have more vision when it's going to be K effect is less than one. And if there's too much vision, now we need to, now, now we need to, uh, uh, adjust the scale another way, we need, to, we need to say that we need to reduce the amount of neutron gain for that for that work. Okay. And so what this K effect does is it, it manipulates how much fission there is in the system to get you an exact balance. Okay. And so this, this is typically what's going on. If we look at the actual equation that was happening, so if we need to plus absorption at equal fission, if we were to write that on the equation. Uh, we would say here, so this, this L here is a leakage operator, A is an absorption operator, and psi here is what we call our angular flux, which is related to the number of instabilities on our system uh, at different points in space, in different directions, and different angles. Okay, and so that leakage plus absorption has to, has to equal the fission, the amount of, the amount of neutron creating fission. And then 1 over K here. That is, the, that is the amount we're going to adjust that fission to get it in, in, into perfect balance. That is what the multiplication factor is. So it's an eigenvalue. And so that eigenvalue says we, how much we need to adjust this value. Of okay, so that's, that's all it's doing. And so when we say k bigger than one, what we're saying is that the k bigger than one, that means we needed to increase the amount of vision over here to get our balance. In the case less than one, we needed to increase the amount of vision to get balance. Okay, that's what the, that's what the uh, uh, k eigenvalue or the multiplication factor is telling us, and it comes that it comes from this balance equation right here and how we multiply it. Okay, but it tells us about balance. It does not tell us about the time the time behavior. Of this. It says. What, what can happen at long time, or what do I need to do to get a steady solution here? If we think about what's actually happening here, so we're, we're adjusting the amount of fish. So if we look at uh, what happens in fish, so in, in, in the fish process, a neutron comes in, splits, splits the nucleus, and we get more, more neutrons out, so it's bigger neutron. And those have an energy distribution. So this right here is data from end of eight uh, for the energy distribution of neutrons coming out of fission with the radius 235. And we see that most of the neutrons are, co are coming out in this NEV range, so at higher energies. So, uh, so what we're doing when we are subcritical, we're, making, we're artificially increasing the amount of fission, we're actually, in a sense, making the neutron spectrum harder. We are adding high energy neutrons to our system. To get that balance. Similarly, for supercritical, we're going to be subtracting all neutrons in that shape, and we're going to be removing high energy neutrons, making the, the spectrum softer 
by, by removing the sign of reasons. So we're not when we adjust the amount of fission, we're also adjusting the spectrum of energy that we come to exist at and inside of us. Okay, so let's look at a, a time dependent calculation for that system that, that I showed before, that subcritical system. And we're going to be looking at two things. So on the left here, we're going to, this is the neutron population uh, in, different, in different energy regimes. So, so fast, this is close to that, that MEV range we talked about. And then in between is epithermal range here, and then the blue is thermal. So remember, this system we're initiating it by putting it in fast, pulsing MEV neutrons. And so initially, that's the three minus that we have. Fast neutrons here, and they're they're being absorbed as they go in, they get absorbed. So that's why it's falling out there. And so we'll, we'll look at over time what happens is we start off with a lot of fast neutrons, those fall off, and now we start building up these thermal neutrons that start to inflate several times. So fast neutrons get absorbed, we build up thermal neutrons, and fast neutrons scatter inside this plastic. And so there's a lot of time dynamics going on here. And this, so this is looking at how things are behaving in space in different energy. This next figure we're going to look at looks at in the mid the midpoint of the, the block and inside of the fuel, what is the energy spectrum of neutron? And so uh, in this video, we're, we're looking so the, the orange is the midpoint of this, and then the, the red is, uh, is, is inside of the fuel, and then these gas lines are what the spectrum looks like in the K eigenvalues solutions. What is the fundamental mode met multiplication factor analysis? And what we see is that inside of the middle of, of the, the block here, there's a lot of slow neutrons here at the top of the uh, like sub EV range. And then in the in the fuel, in the in that fundamental mode of the multiplication factor solution, we have this green dash line. And we see that the time dependent solution does start to go to that green line, but it takes a long time to get there. And it never quite gets, it never quite gets there inside the middle of the block. The, the time it takes to realize is much longer than the simulation time here than this than the settlement. Okay. So uh, even though if we if we were to let us go for a longer period of time, we might we might tend to approach the, the dash lines, we never actually get there in this in this experiment that we did. And so if you were to do this experiment. And measure the neutrons for a short period of time, you would add the, the actual, the, the solution you get from the KI and other problem. Don't tell you a lot about what's happening here. Okay, so along our journey, so I said by pizza that criticality, the multiplication factor is not enough to tell us about these systems where things are, are changing. And so now, uh, to answer, to, to say something about these systems in that case, now we're going to kind of introduce the, the idea of an eye So something that's an eye value is not just the multiplication of the chain reaction, but how fast is it proceed? That's what we're going to deal with. But uh, one, one morning, there are complex numbers that have to come into play here. But we'll, we'll try that on another way. Okay, so we have, going back to our balance in before. Now I'm going to instead of having a steady state problem, now we have a time of neutron. So now there's now I'm allowing the, 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 the neutron population to change in time. And that term that term looks like this. So we have one over the neutron speed, uh, this V as a function of E, and then this is the time derivative of the uh, the angular flux of the neutron. So it's big it as the neutron density. So we include this time derivative here, but I do want to solve time of problems that might be too hard. So what we do is we say, let's look for solutions of the form of a, a function of space, direction, and energy times an exponential uh, with, a, with, a, with a given uh, 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 time constant net exponential that alpha. And if I plug this into this equation and simplify, I end up with this. Now I have a, another steady equation that I can solve. Similar to what I solved for the multiplication factor, but now instead of having a one over k here, now I have this, this alpha here and this uh, inverse speed there. Okay, so this these alphas are called alpha eigenvalues, and uh, there are uh, so whatever value alpha will allow this equation to balance 
are all ideas of loops. And so now on our on our balance here, we have leakage, and in this term here, that looks like absorption plus an extra stuff that, that depends on the size of that house. And so now when if the uh, when alpha is large, we're going to be increasing that as both in term. Yeah. And when alpha is small, we're going to be in that. Okay, so now instead of adjusting vision, we're actually adjusting the amount of absorption in the atomic to, to find that thing. Yeah, uh, and so if alpha is positive, that means we're adding absorption. And if alpha is negative, we're removing absorption. We're, we're, Maybe uh, there would be less of the inside the problem. And so those alphas are called the kind of values. So those eigenvalues can become complex, they can be, they can be complex values, uh, and they're also complicated. Uh, but all, usually when people think about alpha eigenvalues, there's one of them that's considered to be important. We'll see why. It's, so remember, alpha tells us about its exponential dynamics. So alpha positive means there's exponential growth, alpha negative, uh, the, the negative real part would be exponential decay, and alpha zero means that it, we, so there's no kind of dynamics. Okay, so this eigenvalues, can, if we think about them in complex planes, which is the real part of alpha, the imaginary part, uh, they can be isolated. And so here's some of our isolated eigenvalues. They can also sit on curves, you know, in a, uh, in, on continuous curves inside a complex plane. So here's here's some of those. So any value along this curve could be an eigenvalue, which is that you saw. And then also, if we go far enough to the left in the complex plane, there's a whole continuum of uh, eigenvalues out there. Okay. The one the, the eigenvalue that we that we are typically most concerned about. Is the one that is farthest to the right in the complex plane. This one right here. And this one we see is also on the real axis. This one would be purely real. Right? And we care about this one because if we wait long enough, whichever one's farthest to the right, that curve is going to stay around the longest. So if, if, if that alpha is negative, it's going to take the longest to decay. And if alpha is positive, it, that one's going to grow the fastest. It turns out that we call that right of the sign value. The fundamental eigenvalue is referring to as alpha hat. So, so that we recognize it's that fundamental eigenvalue. And that's the only one that can be positive. So it can, it can be, uh, uh, it's only one that can be to the right of the imaginary axis. That, so that's the one that can So if I have a supercritical system, I will have a positive alpha because I'll have exponential growth in time. And that's what. This is showing here. So, so if this if this eye is the right on the imaginary axis, positive, but for the supercritical and about exponential growth. If it's zero, that means there's a mode that doesn't decay in time, but it's changing time. And then if it's negative, that means all of our modes are will eventually decay in time. And we'll have a subcritical system. Okay. So in a real calculation, we're never going to see that whole continuum because we're solving things, we're solving things on a grid, we're solving discreetly. And so this is what we get from uh, a calculation like on that, that experiment that, that I showed earlier of the, the plastic and the, uh, the fuel of the four So what we see here, this is that fundamental eigenvalue here, and it's a subvertical system, so it is, it is negative. And the negative real part, and it is real. And then we, we find all these other items. And the difference between the symbol we'll get to a little bit. But uh, the thing is, in a, in a real experiment, that alpha cap may not actually see it. They have been looking at the system for a short period of time. This, this item value you can show that it can be arbitrarily close to zero on the left hand side of the system. If I consider my system to be, if, if I start adding things in like the room and things like that, because this, that mode can be affected by how long it takes you to slow as you try to travel across the system. Okay, so just because it's in fundamental mode may not be something that actually shows up in your experiment, depending on how you model the system. But we all think about what this is, what these ideas are doing for our So remember, we said that. K eigenvalue, a small multiplication factor, we're adding vision neutrons, adding NV 
its neutron source. With an alpha eigenvalue, with high eigenvalue, remember we're adding these inverse proportional to C. And so here, this red curve here, that's the actual working process in the rate of 35 as a function of neutron energy. And then these dashed lines are uh, a value for alpha times the inverse speed. So the inverse speed gets larger as you go to lower energy because the neutrons are going slower. The inverse speed gets, uh, gets larger. And you see that so we're actually adding things uh, in the low part, the low energy part of the spectrum, which is, which is the opposite of what we were doing for the KI in the case. So it's not just that we're we're adding we're adding or, or subtracting absorption to get a steady state. We're also adjusting the spectrum in a different way than the KI And that's more to just point out that, that, that these things are fundamentally different, but it also uh, lets us think that when I'm far away from the steady state, what I would find in an alpha eigenvalue estimate versus a KI eigenvalue estimate could be very different in terms of the neutron spectrum in the Okay, how do we calculate these, these things? So we're going to go back to the equations that we saw. And so if we, uh, I, I, will, I will postulate that we have an efficient method of computing KI in the properties. We have to do this. There are Monte Carlo methods to do it, there are deterministic methods. We know how to solve a KI in the problem. These alpha eigenvalue problems are more complicated because alpha can be, uh, it, it can be complex. But also because the alphas are hemi negative. And so, what, one way that we can solve these problems is to actually formulate a K eigenvalue problem. We do that by we guess a value for alpha. So, we'll call that a guess alpha L. And then we, and then we solve a K eigenvalue of that value for alpha. And if K is 1, that means that that is an alpha and we didn't have to adjust the addition. So this is called K alpha iteration. So I guess alpha could do K and then do like a secret method to figure out uh, where I expect uh, K to be equal to one and adjust alpha for you. Okay. So this is a pretty straightforward numerical procedure. Uh, it's something you can do with bisection or secant or any kind of these non-linear solvers that uh, have been around. One issue is that if alpha is negative, now I'm subtracting off absorption, and I'm subtracting off absorption proportional to one over the speed of the neutron. So for the slow neutron, I could be subtracting off a large amount. I could, and it could make this overall absorption term here, could make it negative. And so what that means is, as neutrons are moving through my system, instead of being absorbed, they're actually growing. And that's numerically unstable, and it can be very hard to solve. And so that's the case with this type of approach. All you can do is find that fundamental mode. You can't look at you can't look at other modes of your system because this term is too negative in your solvers that work. Solvers that you design that design to get that with are not robust to having negative absorption. Okay, so what what can we do about that? So one thing we can do is using a method that's not all that old. Uh, and it's not designed for neutronics, but it turns out we can use a cool input of it, and it's called dynamic mode decomposition. And the dynamic mode is a purely data driven method that allows us to learn what's happening inside an operator, but we don't know the operator. So let's say I have a, a, a sequence of vectors that are solutions that are, that can come from basic anger, that is a time sequence of things. And so I'm going to call those y. So each of these y is a vector that's my solution at a given time. I say I know that there is some operator that's connecting these. So in this case, like uh, y k plus one is equal to a times y k. I might not know what a is, but I know that there's something that is governing the transition from state y k is y k plus one. Okay. So. Uh, this is so we're, we're populating this, we're not saying anything about it. Uh, we are going to get a linear operator, which is neutron transport, it is. And then what we do is we take these vectors y and we build up these what are called data matrices, snapshot matrices. And it could be, will be problem scenes, but there'll be, there'll be n rows, each of these is length n, and, uh, and k columns. 
Okay, and then this equation here now says that y plus is equal to a times y minus. And the uh, so we don't know what a is, but we, we know y minus and y minus. So what we can do is well, if we think about it uh, from a uh, perspective of a is moving us from each of the, from one state to another. If we had enough of these factors, we would hope to be able to say something about it. The operator that's next. Okay, so what we do is we take uh, we take this y minus matrix and we do what is called a singular value decomposition, a very common uh, operation in, in, in data science. And we take we take that singular value decomposition and we can construct an approximate uh, operator that is called a to from the data alone. We just take the data and using the singular value decomposition, we construct a an approximate operator table. Okay. And we, we need to know nothing about it when it's purely data-driven approach to figuring out this operator A. And so this uh the data could be from an estimate of the factor inside the system, or it could be from uh, it could be from our simulation, whatever it is, to be would be inferred this approximate operator A. Okay, and that approximate operator and that, that construction of it is called the dynamic movie. Okay, so with that approximate operator A, we can do things like try to uh, try to predict what's going to happen in the system in the future. And so to show that purely data driven approach, what I did here is in this top figure over there, I had uh, I started off with a uh, 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 a matrix of zero everywhere except for uh, inside of the circle that I had in the way, and then I mechanically moved it. Uh, around in this in this circle like that, and I gave each of those uh, the, the data to each of those snapshots, okay. and did the dynamic composition, and then took that approximate operator A, gave the initial condition, said, okay, what's going to happen next? So that's what we're getting out here. So this is the whole group of that dynamic composition, and I'm not trying to get into But so one thing that that, that comes out here is like, okay, this thing it seems to be happening with dynamics up here. This is, this is the most difficult case of trying to learn the dynamics just from the data, but it's doing a pretty good job. And another kind of bonus feature we get from this approach is that if I do an SVD and I truncate it, uh, if I truncate very small singular values in it, called truncated SVD, it gets rid of the noise that I added up here. So this one down here doesn't have, doesn't have the amount of noise that I added. That's kind of a uh, uh, a beneficial side effect this approach. Okay, what does this have to do with neutron transport? So, if we take uh, our solution from a time dependent uh, neutron transport problem, like the one I showed earlier in those videos, and I do this dynamic movie composition, and I get an approximate operator A tilde, what I can do with that A tilde is I can find out its eigenvalues, eigenvectors. And you can show that the eigenvalues of A tilde are also eigenvalues of A, and the eigenvectors of A tilde, uh, you can relate them to eigenvectors of A. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm taking my neutron data, my solution, and I'm using that to find out, find, find the eigenvalues of A, which are those time eigenvalues that I see for a hard calculation of the matrix. And so that's how I generate this figure here with these. Eigenvalues, these time eigenvalues, so that that system is all for. So we're doing that with the EMD. And because it's purely data driven, depending on what time, uh, the vector is plugged at which times that I that I put into my data matrix, I get different eigenvalues. So I know very early in time, there's a lot of things to pay, and I have that subcritical multiplication, all that. I get all these blue eigenvalues. That if I look a little bit later now, these orange ones are included in the system. And this green one out there, this that was that was there all along with you know, all those other nodes that were still decaying, and that they found these three nodes there in the late time, close to one another. Okay. So we hope that the what the PMP said is uh, where I the data I get tells me about what what a node got by. And in that in the time we get it. Which with value values I get were important to the solution, the solution dynamic at that time. So it's kind of a it solves two problems. It allows us to get multiple values, multiple intel value values, but also 
And people that use it for other things since we came out of that a few years ago, so you can use it to accelerate uh, the calculation of AI and values uh, by forming this quantum operator and, and uh, projecting your iteration forward. Uh, people use it to analyze molten salt reactor forward, so they're looking at the uh, how things are evolving uh, in time inside of, inside of the, this system here. Uh, you can also use it because because DMD is completely operated free, all the different things, you can go through experiments, and there's a group of mechanics in doing that, using DMD to analyze some subcritical experiments that they're doing. And people have also looked at it for a radiation transfer. Okay, so uh, just briefly, I want to say we talked about that dragon experiment at the beginning, and we said the lady found more important. So, one thing with DMD that uh, I didn't, didn't show this exactly maybe in the equations is that it assumes that the time step, the time difference between each of those snapshots is the same. Okay. And so here I'm showing two uh two the need some population function of time. Okay. And the, the time here goes from uh less than a nanosecond up to uh greater than a second. And so if I want to do this with a constant time step and 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 uh be able to resolve this initial subcritical multiplication and then the fall down, uh, both the scale of lab steps. And also, if I, one of these is subcritical, one of them is supercritical. And you can't tell until, what, until later when, so the subcritical system eventually, the delayed neutrons are there, uh, the supercritical system, sorry, the delayed neutrons are enough to get the chain reaction growing. And that's after 100 seconds, okay? And the subcritical one, it does eventually die. Okay, so we care about problems that have these, these very disparate time scales. So here are all the, the fact that the prompt neutron initially and then the late neutrons later. You're going to have to take, you know, a building time step to get it. Okay, that would be very hard. These, these uh, vertical lines are actually the, the different uh, one over the, the, the alpha eigenvalues, the real part. So like, there's very fast gaining things, very fast gaining things. The one is, is the one positive period. So you have to wait that long for it to grow. Okay, so not only do we have to take, let's say, a billion time steps, we have to store a billion things in our data matrix. We wanted to look at that, uh, that eigenvalue. So we developed something called variable dynamic movement composition, which allows you to have very precise time steps. We have to uh, have the information about, about what the time of provision is to do that, but it works pretty well. And then you can have relatively state steps. And so you can do this with maybe 100 time steps instead of, instead of a billion. Okay, uh, the other thing is that we're just we, we can make these data matrices. The, uh, we can run out of the memory pretty quick. And so there's another thing you can do with DMD, which is you can actually subsample your data and not have all your data inside of snapshots. You can, you can take a random subset of it, or you can do things like you can use clustering algorithms like K means, find out which points are most representative, what's going on in your system, and so you can reduce the amount of memory. You might not have probably been expected, but we tried this full because we can't allocate 20 gigabytes to for your data matrix. Another thing that's sort of that's interesting about this, this uh, variable dynamic movement composition is that even if you have not great data, if you have your data is coming by American numbers. So this, this is a simple operator example, but the the, the dots here are the solution to different understanding algorithms. And you can see that none of them are actually capturing two dynamic movements very well. But uh, BDMD estimates the, uh, the, the eigenvalues of that system uh, very well, like, like five digits, even though the data itself looks very good. So this thing is actually a, a pretty powerful uh, tool for analysis of these time varying systems. Okay, so to finish up, I wanted to show that, okay, let's say that you're going to go, we want to go beyond the time that we want to do. Really odd in the simulation of these time defense systems. So let's do that. Okay, so in uh, with MTBT, that uh, one, of, one of the fields developed in this, uh, the center for extracellular mining called transport, neutron transport, you've actually said, okay, in a system like Dragon, we have these materials moving around. And if we're going to use mining carbon methods to follow particles through our system, 
Why can't the materials be moving as well and just see where the neutrons would get? And so what that looks like, so let's say we have a scenario where we put things around our neutrons on the scale. And this is my control rod and my fuel. And then the control rod moves and the fuel moves and that. I should be able to track the neutrons uh, through that. So uh, to see, even though it, when they're in the hit point where there's having to be fuel there, we're going to be a control rod. And that's going to affect the dynamics. So we've actually put this into our MVP thing. Uh, this is showing uh, an example calculation where initially you have a, a control rod on the top there and fuel on the bottom. And as you raise the control rod up, you see that now the, the, the power in the system is going up. And uh, and then uh, when you put the control rod back in, you see that it uh, sloshes it back up. And it's something that's easy to do inside of our brain. So that's one thing that, that we have put in our code to be really just kind of time problems. Uh, in a cool way, uh, and, and actually uh, capture to have fidelity for what's going on in the system. But one thing that is difficult with mining particles is that we want to have enough uh, of, the, of our simulated particles to see what's going on at this distance. If we have any time to get problems, if we're super critical, we're going to have exponential growth in neutrons, and we're sub critical with exponential decay. We want to make sure we have enough neutrons, but not too many. And so we took them when they're in the population, we change by a lot, we have to deal with that. And so uh, we need all those things. So here's that variety of experiment from the beginning again. Uh, there, there's one, one difference uh, that I'll have in a second. So on the left here, this is the vision power in the system as a function of time. And so the block will be falling to the top. You see that the vision happening, and then uh, it peaks up here, uh, and then and then it's coming down. You see, we, we don't have enough samples here to see some of the mining problem with this. And over here, this is the neutron flux in that system. Okay, the difference here is we had to use uh, only 30% of the machine for this. Uh, we get this, we get uh, almost a, a 20x increase in the power, but if you remember the experiment, it was nine orders of magnitude, so a uh, factor of a billion. So we are, we have a ways to go, and it's because the number, we can't handle that huge change range of neutrons yet inside of our system. What we can do is we can model the fact that the block is falling, uh, and the speed of that change is hard to see on the scale, but it, it is being moved like it was that deep free fall. Okay. To deal with that, we have to do something called population control, which sounds very ominous. Remember, the, the uh, students working on this uh, when I were uh, at a uh, in a coffee shop talking about population control, and uh, the people were giving us free books, but we were talking about neutrons, not, not actual people. But yeah, and so you have to do things like remove neutrons from your, from your system uh, if, you, if you have a super critical system, or you have to add them to each other. And there are different ways of doing this, and we have to analyze uh, which ways, uh, which ways to give you less add ons in terms of the problem. Uh, and so there, we have some results on that. that uh, we'll take a whole talk to go but uh, we we're able to advance our different approaches. Another, another issue, uh, another interesting thing is uh, when you are doing this on, uh, on a parallel system, when I do this population control, I want to make sure that all the processes are about the same with particles put around. Otherwise, we get loaded down. And so we had to come up with a way of doing that as well. Okay. So with that, we're about at time to talk a lot about dynamic neutron, uh, uh, dynamic neutron, and other things we can do. Uh, I uh, list some of them here. Can we do better than, than regular running cars when we use uh, positive band sequences? Uh, how do you initialize a simulation code? Let's say the system, your, your reactor is critical, then you have some excursion. Uh, how do you initialize that to see what happens? We work on that a little bit. Stochastic algorithm of GPU, which is a feature for computing. They're stochastic algorithms that might follow uh, are, are tricky to get to scale on those systems. And there's all kinds of things about function verification, uncritical modification, they're all uh, all the right fields for uh, investigation. So we're not going to do all that for at time. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. That was really excellent. We'll take some questions from the audience if there are any.
So I can start us off with a question. Okay. Um, with the dragon experiment in particular, is it important to look at Doppler feedback or thermal expansion from the pulse? Like I know this is important. So yes. Yeah. Uh, so the answer is we think no. So the the actual amount of heating of the uh, of the system is not very much. So uh, the the thermal expansion. So Doppler possibly thermal expansion uh, is likely no. Also because of the the time that it's that it's that's together is not not very. Much. But, the, but the Doppler the Doppler might be important. So that would be another part of the time dependence that we didn't talk about is the fact that the neutron. Uh, cross section can be changed over that over that extra page. Yeah. Yes. So, with the higher time values, can you get information about the duration of the spectrum? Yes, you can. So, uh, the question was with the higher eigen values, you get information about the, the duration of the transit. So, what you can do is if you if you take your initial condition. And project it onto those eigen modes, you can see like how much of them is going in each of them, and that will give you information about the transit. Yeah. Okay. It's a little more complicated than that because it's not a self joint operator, so you can do an add. But yes. So I have another question then. Um, Regarding the time dependent nature of the Monte Carlo transport, so you're moving the geometry in steps. No. Oh, it's, 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 it's continuous. We can give it a function. So we want the, the block to be like here at, at, at uh, different, different points in time. Okay, so I'm wondering then, um, you know, when you sample a distance from where the neutron is to where it gets its next collision, yeah. um, do you account for, I guess, how are you doing that? If it's so you end up with uh, an equation to solve. See, uh, where it is at what time, and so and that tells you what material it is. Right, so I guess if you sample the distance that is farther, like it would take the neutron too long to get there. Yes. The geometry would be too different. You need to do it differently. Uh, no, not necessarily. So if, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the, there are markers here. Uh, uh, let's see, start this back up. Although I don't need this for that part, but uh, so the if, if, you, if you were to say what the so let's let's say for this uh, control rod thing, uh, uh, so that it, it's possible the control rod moves too far and, and you would never hit it, right? And so, but uh, so as part of the sampling, so you. Uh, you sample a random number and then you, then you solve, then, then you use like an inverse CBF to see where, so it's all accounted, all that motion is accounted for wow. in, in a consistent collision. So it's, instead of just knowing, okay, I, I go there and I hit this, you, there's actually, you have to solve an equation. Right. Which, and one that helps scalability because then each neutron track is doing a lot more calculation. So we, 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 can, we can use more of the uh, compute power. Uh, one thing that we're not accounting for, so, we're assuming that the neutron is fast relative to the C of the thing that's moving, because if it's not, then you can worry about now you have another sort of Doppler thing because the, because of that, because now the the, the nucleus sees the neutron in the nucleus C. But but for these things are not moving that fast. So right. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. So if you had physics driving the motion, like here you know and it's prescribed, Correct. but if it was physics, like Structural mechanics. How would you approach it like that, or would you just have to solve the CDF numerically? To so I, I think one thing that that you could do, and I hadn't really thought about this, is so you could almost iterate. Say, I think it's going to move this way. Do your do your neutronics and your deposition, and then and, and then use that to well, let's say you're doing the CFD. Then do your CFD and see what the fluid flow speeds are, and like you could iterate on that. But we we haven't we haven't tried doing that yet. Okay. So for, for example, the control rod uh, example that we had there, we actually did compare it to other uh, other published results that people did like stair set the control rod and see that okay, we're getting basically the same thing, but we can uh, uh, get, get finer things. Because the other thing is with those methods, if you take smaller steps, then you need to run more particles typically to, to resolve everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great, thank you. Other questions, yes. So you're doing these like um, 
trying to actually like follow calculate. Are you using applying value to talk about? So uh, no, not me. So uh there there are ways of actually applying values with my Carlo that's called the response matrix method. Uh and but yeah, we're not we're not using them yet. So one of the things we've been thinking is if you knew those how I can use that help you do things like set weight and dynamically, where are you trying to be early in time which is like because most weight weight notes are for shag objects. So uh th that one there is we're actually investigating Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did you did you show the value the alpha? Uh, I, mean, I, I, I don't. I don't think I. I don't think I printed them out. But what, what's the what's the order of magnitude of them? That's oh, so in that one, there were uh, uh, the fastest one was like let's say a tenth of an inverse microsecond. Uh, but so that system, I was only looking at the props. You get feel for you know, yeah, you have a good sense of you know yeah. what pays are, right? You know, yeah. So, but, uh, uh, yeah, it was, uh, and but that one I didn't have any delayed neutrons in it. So when you have delayed neutrons, you can get them sub mill. Well, they can be they can be seconds, kind of, yeah, second and inverse many, seconds. Yeah. And how many rounds did you? I mean, how many times? Uh, oh, okay. 